Sunset at sea has a certain allure. It ignites a dazzling fire in your imagination and on any white painted surface around you. The hues of orange, red, and yellow form a layered spectacle that stops time indoors and out. It doesn't matter if you've made a hundred trips across the ocean or you're making your first. This view is special. It's worth it to open up the doors, take a stroll, put your life in perspective while you have time, because let's face it, the next day could look very different. Welcome to the bridge of the EF Ava. This glowing array of buttons and dials controls the ship taking my cameraman Kirk, myself, and some wild blueberry jam from Maine to Iceland. I know you're tempted to press a button. No. <laughs> I wouldn't dare. From this spot, the highest deck on the EF Ava, Captain Yasek Raviej keeps two watches a day, one from 8 a.m. to noon and a second from 8 to midnight. If you're on watch, you're the person responsible for keeping the ship on course and away from obstacles like other boats and buoys. It's completely dark up here at night. This way you can see anything moving around in the water, like this light that suddenly appeared on the horizon. This will be object on the coast. This will be steady. Turns out it was just a fishing boat and some seagulls. We got fishing here up ahead of you there. Always uh, got the beacon buoys on us there. You can keep my gear on your starboard side so you don't, don't cut it off. It's floating here. Okay, I will take care. These are the types of hazards common on our first leg of the voyage between Portland, Maine and Argentia, Newfoundland, the only stop the Ava makes before Iceland. We're going to show you what day-to-day -day life is like on this cargo ship, from the engine room to the bridge, and because it's cool, give you a quick taste of Newfoundland at the end. But we are starting with the bridge, because it's where Kirk and I spent a lot of time when we weren't in our cabin. Louder than a dial-up modem, the weather report comes in via satellite internet. We can expect some strong wind. With this information, the ship's officers can set a heading and speed. In these shots, we're steaming at 17 knots, the ship's high cruising speed in international waters. The goal, to beat a storm to Newfoundland. We have uh, more speed, some more consumption, and this is the uh, maximum echo speed. The charter. They want me to keep ETA first, and after, keep the lowest consumption. The captain is keeping us 12 miles off the Canadian coast. Any closer, and we'd have to clear customs twice. It sure feels like international waters out here. Captain Jacek is Polish, Chief Mate Dmitry is Russian, the Chief Engineer, Second Mate, and Electrician are Ukrainian. The Second Engineer and the rest of the crew is Filipino. These guys are contracted by a German company to operate the ship. And that German company is contracted by Aimskip, an Icelandic company, to run the Portland to Reykjavik route and make stops in Canada. Hey, Justin. Yeah. Are you there yet? <laughs> Not even close. Kirk and I were the only two Americans. Two other Icelanders were on board with us. Everybody spoke English. In total, we had 17 people on board a slow boat built in China that had words in Danish written on it. Dinner is ready if you like to go to dinner. Thank you. A good way to keep everybody happy on board is to keep them fed. Just like the crew, Kirk and I were provided three meals a day, prepared by the cook in the galley. Breakfast was fairly standard, bacon or sausage with eggs how you like them, and a few slices of tomato. Most of the European guys preferred to put cheese or meat on some bread lunch was hearty. Over the eight-day trip, we had chicken, beef or fish, simmered, fried, baked with a couple sides like a baked or mashed potato, and some coleslaw. Dinner was fairly similar to lunch, and Sundays, there was dessert. One particular dinner stood out. Our second full day aboard the EF Ava, as soon as we saw sun, a grill was dragged out onto the poop deck. 
along with most of the dining room. Hello, welcome to our barbecue party. If we have a good condition, good weather, uh, the captain, there's, they're making something like this, especially when the guy was go, going home, finished contract, so they have a small party like this. I, I make like this every time when I'm on the ship. Of course, the weather permitting sometimes. We have uh, one time bad weather and the rain, and it was not possible. With a view like this, it makes sense to dine al fresco every once in a while. The crew doesn't let a slight breeze get in the way of a good party. Uh-oh. Gotta cover the meat back up. That's a nice piece of meat. Pork belly, lamb, chicken, steak, giant chunk of whatever, dozens and dozens of pieces of meat, meat and more meat were hauled from the freezer to be flung on the grill. I have some lamb over here and a piece of chicken over there. This piece is already good. Excluding the guys on watch, the remaining 15 of us were scooping all kinds of salads and sauces on our plates. This has to be one of the most coolest things I've ever done. I got a little pork belly here, barbecued. The guy in charge of the deck crew, Ramus Clavel, gave me the lowdown on the Filipino dishes. What's in here? Uh, some uh, spicy, spicy chili, vinegar, garlic. Chili. Some... It's really good. Yeah. Is that normally what you have at home or yeah. <laughs> keeps you warm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's this? This is uh, uh, Filipino fried rice. This one with onion and uh, a fried egg and mixed with the mixed rice. All together. Yeah, all mixed. Chewing eventually gave way to talking. The topic, our destination. <laughs> Fall in Iceland is like what? It's October and you can expect uh, Every kind of weather. I mean, it can be snow, and it can be raining, and it can be warm, but usually it starts getting colder and colder. Finor Finsen and Sigpur Augustin are native Icelanders who were Aimskip employees in charge of the cargo on our ship. Sigpur was an electrician who would fix reefers or the refrigerated containers. Finor's job title was more exciting. His role was called supercargo. So is that like a superhero? No, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> so, it's just an extra job to assist uh, the seamate about the loading. We sometimes discuss if we want to have it on in some different way. Finor explained this journey would be one of his last, and he'd be retiring soon, after a career that's taken him to Asia and all over Europe. He told us his retirement plan included exploring more of his home country since he spent so much time at sea. I wanted to know what he thought of all the people like Kirk and me interested in traveling to Iceland now. When did this remote volcanic island get so popular, and why? Are you surprised that Iceland is so popular now, or did you always know it could be like that? I think it was popular because of the volcano. AF at Layugut, maybe you remember the name. Yeah, I did. Uh, <laughs> I remember not being able to say the name. No, no. <laughs> How do you say it again? Eja Fjalla Jökull. Eja Fjalla Jökull. Fjalla Jökull. Jökull is a glacier. We had the... Um, explosion in tourists and the last years I think we have been one to one and a half million people visiting Iceland. Is that good? Good. Yeah. I don't know, it's good but it, it saved the economy. Give it a shot. <laughs> How's the dicks? Well, I don't have much choice now, do I? It's pretty good though. It's better than I thought. On our way to Iceland, Kirk and I were graciously given the largest cabin on the ship. This is where we usually hung out for a little bit after meals, especially when the weather was rough and we weren't sleeping all that much. We had a fridge, a TV, a bathroom with a shower, two beds, an electric tea kettle. To be honest, it was pretty comfortable. That is, until the waves came. But more on that in our next episode. The weather was generally calm on our way to Newfoundland. This meant Kirk and I could go out on deck, or as long as we hung on to the rope up to the bow. We got to see how the containers are lashed down after departure, how the windows get cleaned, how the floor gets mopped, sandals required of course, where the smoking room was, and how generally there's a lot of downtime. So this is what ship life is like. Kind of boring and exciting all at the same time. Yeah. It's interesting moving but also being trapped in this, what, it's 400 feet long or something. It's kind of weird how many times I've tried to check my cell phone. Just for email, 
Yeah, it's been funny telling you not to check your email. <laughs> the interesting thing is you almost have time to procrastinate and you can work on your stuff when you want to work on it. Decide that you don't want to work on it for a little bit because you still have however many days left of your trip. You're going to be moving no matter what so you don't have to concentrate on the journey. You just zone out and start bubbling, creating. While Kirk and I were able to do our work, writing and editing at our leisure, Manny decks below us the real business of keeping the ship and our wild blueberry jam moving was being done. This is our engine control room. Every time when I try to explain the shore guys, well, my opinion is the bridge, bridge is a head of the vessel, but we are hard. Here in a labyrinth of rooms, air compressors, and workbenches, the EFAVA's chief engineer Michael Yazvodchuk and his team ensure a giant engine keeps the vessel moving through whatever Mother Nature throws at the ship. Let me introduce this our fitter, Alan, very good fitter. Can do everything. I'm sorry, everything. Just about anything and everything to do with the ship's engine or fuel can be measured and monitored. The day Michael invited us downstairs, his guys were conducting an oil test to make sure there wasn't too much water in it. If something wrong with our stern tube, we will get uh, water inside lube oil, basically. So this is a special test to determine water in oil. Frankly, trying to understand an engine system that's two stories high is a bit overwhelming. But Michael and his team have this stuff down pat. They can fix anything in these rooms at any time in any weather. Yeah, for common people which come on board, it's a very difficult even remember what need to do. But if you stay in this industry from the beginning, everything's the same. Maybe, okay, this, for example, this button. Yeah, this is a button for LT Hyper Cooling Water Pump, located here on this vessel. But on other vessel, we need this corner. But if you know what you need to press, you will press exactly what you need. You're just passenger, of course. If you compare the, for example, uh, cruise liner, every one, two days you have a port, you can go ashore. And here sometimes I can not go ashore due to business. I've been on board one vessel in 2005 working as floatel in the center of the Mexico Gulf, yeah? And this vessel stay on anchor years and years and years. And in this time, no communication at all. At all, man. In 21 century, I write not email, just mail. And use the ordinary mail to send some, some news to my family. This is also like an uh, iron box. Inside the iron box, one year. Could you imagine yourself inside the iron box? This was a theme the whole crew mentioned to us. They're here because working at sea pays well. They're not here for fun. This isn't a hobby. These guys all miss their wives and kids waiting in Ukraine, the Philippines, Iceland, Latvia, and Poland for their sailors to come home. My wife was sending me the picture. <laughs> That's great. Like Lord Vader. <laughs> See? It's time to write down everything we own so the Canadians don't take it from us. On a bleak but calm day, Newfoundland appeared in front of us. For at least an hour, we cruised up Placentia Bay. Mounds of hard rock and all manner of lumpiness popped up around us in increasing frequency until finally we reached Argentia. With only hours to soak in the Canadian rain and eager to enjoy some time on land before the five-day sea passage, Kirk and I rushed off the boat to meet Frank Barry, Ameskip's coordinator in Newfoundland. 
We wanted to learn as much as we could about this stop for Maine's Iceland-bound ships. Turns out, a lot of Americans visited here before us. This is the north side of Argentia. It was owned by the Americans, and they had a naval base here, and behind you, or behind the vessel, on the other side here was the south side, where it was mostly living quarters. And uh, this is where they used to come in to fuel, the, fuel their ships submarines, warships, it was during the war time. In 1941, FDR and Churchill actually met for the first time face to face right off this shore. That August, the two of them signed the Atlantic Charter on a battleship that was anchored here. The document the two men signed would outline aims and understandings during the Second World War. Fun fact, after the meeting was over, President Roosevelt sailed to Rockland, Maine aboard his presidential yacht. Today, the villages dotting Placentia Bay are much quieter. There was a lot of, uh, we'll say, Newfoundlanders that worked on the American base for many, many years. And uh, when the base closed in the early 90s, a lot of people had to go elsewhere to work. To make the best use of our shore time, we decided to hop in a taxi. We had no particular destination in mind. Kirk, myself, even Captain Yasek just wanted to see this place. We do have a beautiful boardwalk. Okay, well, you just see that retaining wall down there earlier. Lisa McGrath owns Five Star Taxi and can get visitors like us from the port in Argentia to the next biggest town called Placentia. You're probably thinking, wow, Placentia sounds an awful lot like another word I know. You'd be right. And there's more fun town names where that came from. Like one of the little communities is called Dildo. It's a very popular place for tourists. I really don't know where the names came from, but there is a lot of strange names. This must also be the ultimate place for storytelling, ghost stories and all that. 100% sure. Yep. Uh, my husband is from the Cape Shore, and you will hear a lot of ghost stories from people out there. You know, they could have been just driving into Cape Shore, and all of a sudden, they could feel the wind. Somebody got in, sat down on the, in the seat. We didn't see any ghosts, but we did drive through a graveyard. We also saw the churches, the bar, some video of a moose Lisa took, and met more locals. What are you at there, Patty? What are you at there, Lisa? This is it. How you making out with business today? Oh, not bad. And you went by? Oh, he's just doing some video and they're uh, with the ship down in Argentia. Oh, yeah. So, go on home now and get dressed up for this. The population, that's the big story around here. Like Maine, Newfoundland is aging out. Younger people are moving away to other parts of Canada for good paying jobs and places with more Tim Hortons. Some are staying, but in Lisa's daughter's case at least, staying comes with a long commute. Like my daughter travels an hour and a half each way. Uh, for work. Every day? Every day. Um, but once again, she is home and she wants to make sure that her child, her son gets to uh, grow up here. So. Is there something unique about this place that you've never been able to find anywhere else? Well, I mean, it's a very friendly area. Um, it's, it's, I don't know, I guess it's just everybody is pretty, pretty close, you know. Um, Everybody is just, um, how can I put it? I don't know, like I say, everybody is just very friendly and it's, it's home. Like there's no other way of me putting it, it's home. <laughs> Maybe some Mainers will find that feeling familiar. The EF Ava, home for Kirk and me, at least for now, was about to leave with more cargo. While we were gone, a number of containers were loaded, including 25 tons of Newfoundland nickel. By nightfall, just a few hours after arriving in Argentia, we were heading back out. The glittering lights of Placentia Bay began to fade. It was clear we were going somewhere far away from our home. That said, when you're stuck with a good crew and there's a karaoke machine on board, you at least have the ingredients for a good time. No, no, no. Your real home may be thousands of miles from your ship, somewhere way beyond the fiery horizon. But good friends and good food are most of what you need to get through whatever the ocean throws at you. Like the 20-foot waves we'll ride next time on Ship Me Out.